Close computer, right? We are recording. So now I can welcome you. So tonight we welcome Jonathan Wood, who lives in Brisbane with his wife and their two children. Jonathan started meditating in the mid 80s when he was studying psychology in the USA. At that time, his practice was Tian, transcendental meditation, in which you concentrate on the repetition of a mantra. So around the year 2000, he was living in Wellington and he discovered the Dharma. Jonathan became a member of the secular insight meditation Sangha that I was running at the time. But in 2011, he moved to Brisbane with his family. So now for me, this was a very, this was a sad time, very sad. Saying that Trump, wasn't he? Dear. It's true though, very sad. Currently, Jonathan works for Children's Health Queensland, managing a program which aims to reduce the impact of middle ear disease on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children. I've actually written middle war disease, and I had to work out what that was. I'm <laughs> sure. So John has a regular meditation practice, and he teaches the introduction to, to mindfulness course from Mindfulness Works, which also you may know from Wellington. So he's with us this evening to talk about desire, craving, and the four tasks. So Jonathan, welcome back to Wellington, virtually. I'll leave it over to you. Thank you very much, Randy, and uh, thank you for having me in your in your um, in your meditation group today. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm going to talk about a, a project which I embarked on. I call it a project, but I guess it was a bit of a life change. Um, where last year I decided to try and impact the reduced craving in my life. And this wasn't a New Year's resolution. Um, although it was slightly uh, inspired by Ramsey's year of living without the year before in 2016, which we'll probably talk to you about. Um, but really it came from uh, my uh, many years of mindfulness practice and the increased awareness I got um, over that time of my own patterns and my own experience, particularly with regard to, to craving. Um, I'd also been reading quite a lot about the Four Noble Tasks, um, including Stephen Batchelor's work and, and others. Um, so this talk is really about reflecting on my experience of trying to put these things into practice. I know I gather you're all quite familiar with, with the Noble Tasks um, and, and maybe with the teachings that underlie them. Um, so I'm going to talk more about putting those things into practice. Now this is really very much based on my own experience. Um, so everybody will have their different interpretation of these things. And of course, the noble tasks themselves are a hugely rich subject. Once you disappear down the rabbit hole of, of, of the noble truths or the noble tasks, or whatever you want to call them, you can really branch out into all sorts of different aspects of Buddhist teaching and Buddhist thought and Buddhist philosophy. Um, but I'm going to focus very much on, on the practice of the tasks today. Um, and along the way, I'm going to mention some of the sources of ideas and the references that I've found useful um, as I've been, uh, I suppose, yeah, following this project or following this path. In particular, I want to acknowledge an online course that I did uh, that went into some depth into what these tasks mean in practice. Uh, and this course was um, offered by Tricycle Magazine, the Buddhist Review, which some of you may be familiar with. And if you haven't read it, I really recommend it. Um, and it was run by staff from the UK's Body College, which was set up by Stephen Batchelor uh, and a number of others. Uh, and the course was run by Stephen and um, some of his colleagues, Christina Feldman, John Peacock and, and Kitchener Weber all of whom were great teachers and uh, had a lot of wisdom and it was a really wonderful course to do. These online courses are fantastic because you can, you can sign up to them and then basically you get access to the material whenever you want it, so you can do it at your own pace. So they're great things to do. So you can look out for those things. The course was actually run on what was called the Four Noble Truths because, um, as you may know, the, the, the most common translation of the um, Buddhist teaching in that particular discourse is the Noble Truths. Um, although I know a lot of people have challenged that translation and you'll see them translated as the truths of the noble ones. Um, some of teachers, some of Stephen's colleagues at Body College called it then the ennobling truths. But here I'm going to really focus on Stephen's interpretation, which were the four noble tasks. So what are those tasks? Well, you, again, you probably know them, so I'm not going to dwell on them in great detail. But for those who aren't familiar, so familiar, 
Um, the, the first one is to fully recognize and embrace things as they are, including the, the dukkha. So that's about embracing life. Letting go of the craving that is the source of suffering in our lives. Thirdly, realizing the cessation of suffering as a result. And fourthly, cultivating what's known as the Eightfold Path, which is right understanding, right thought, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort or mental attitude, some people might say, right mindfulness and right concentration. And in a sense, they provide the ethical context for the, for the rest of the practice. Um, and Stephen sometimes refers to this using the acronym ELSA, E-L-S-A. So the E is embracing life as it is. The L is letting go of craving. And you have stopping grasping. And lastly, acting. And I think that last one is really important because the key thing about these teachings is that it's not just an idea. It's not a concept. Uh, it needs to be taken out into your everyday life and, and practiced in the world. And that's why Stephen was really started to refer to these as tasks. And I, I, just, I find that particularly useful. The other thing to bear in mind, these tasks aren't, aren't a sort of sequence, although they're often known as the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. You shouldn't think of them in terms of a sequence that you complete one and then move on to the next and so on. They're overlapping and they're mutually supportive. Uh, and any kind of journey um, down this path is inevitably going to be iterative. Um, and and, and the, 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 the fourth noble task of engaging on, on, in the Eightfold Path really runs parallel to all of the rest. And you, as you're passing through the path, in fact, the, 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 the Eightfold Path itself is iterative. Um, you don't um, start with um, uh, you know, right understanding and then move on to right thought and right speech and so on. You really should be embracing them all at the same time, perhaps with right mindfulness. Um, so th they're a collection of ideas that uh, are to be engaged with, but not in any particularly uh, sequential order. So I'm going to offer my reflections really on, particularly on the first three of those uh, tasks and, and putting them into practice. So the first one of them is, is embracing life as it is, really. And Stephen makes the point that the real problem with craving is that it prevents us leading uh, a full life. Uh, fundamentally, because if you're craving something, you're really not accepting things as they are. You're wanting something that you don't have. Uh, you wanted to get rid of something that you do have. You might be clinging to the status quo in the face of change that is an inevitable part of life. Because as we know, and the teachings tell us, everything arises and passes away. Everything that is conditioned is impermanent. But we often act and think as if the world is characterized by permanence rather than impermanence or change which is one of the sort of delusions that we, we labor under, in a sense. Um, another one of those key delusions, which particularly relates to this question of craving, is that we externalize the source of our happiness. So most people have some kind of version of, if only I had X, then I would be happy. Or perhaps even, if only I had X, then I could stop wanting. Um, so it's true that uh, external objects or external um, relationships or experiences can bring pleasure, but that pleasure itself tends to be transitory. It arises and passes away like everything else. And the passing away of that pleasure can itself create more dissatisfaction or suffering. So there's a, there's a cycle there that we feel dissatisfied, we crave, we may obtain, but then, but then we realize that we don't get the satisfaction that we expected, so the dissatisfaction remains in that re, and then craving re-emerges once again. The, one of the other characteristics associated with this is often the feeling at the back of the mind that something needs to be fixed. And certainly this is something that comes up a lot in the meditation classes that I teach over here. Um, people feeling that maybe something needs to be fixed in their environment in their home or their garden or perhaps their car or whatever it may be. And uh, I mean, over there you've got Mitre 10 and here we've got Bunnings and these guys make a fortune out of this kind of feeling. Um, sometimes though we're feeling that it's other people that need to be fixed. And we're very good at, at, at judging 
uh, right and wrong and clinging to those notions of right and wrong in the judgments we made of others. But we're also, of course, very judgmental of ourselves. Um, and I'm not sure whether you guys have covered the teaching. You've probably come across Tara Brach. And Tara teaches the, uh, about what something she calls the trance of unworthiness, which is really this judgment of ourselves and leading a life that, that is really um, caught up in the delusion that we in, sense, we in some sense are unworthy. And of course, there's a whole industry that's built up around this, around self-help. Uh, I don't know what it's like in New Zealand these days, but every second corner around in my neighborhood in Brisbane, we've got these 24-hour gyms opening, and there's guys there at all times, and there's usually guys uh, at all times of the day and night pumping iron and trying to improve themselves in some way. But of course, I guess, you know, we shouldn't really criticize because <laughs> um, we're, a member of, we're members of mindfulness groups and meditation, and that's also in a way about, about um, uh, looking at ourselves and trying to improve the quality of our lives in some kind of way. So the other thing about embracing life is really that we need to be embracing uh, the dukkha or the suffering that is involved in the process of living. Um, and the course that I did was uh, offered some quite interesting reflections on that. In particular, what exactly do we mean by dukkha? Because the common translation, which is suffering, is, is the, the teachers suggested too blunt a translation of what that really meant in Pali. So a better translation that suggested is something like anything that might make, make us feel contracted or anxious or disappointed in some kind of way, deficient, unsafe, perhaps painful or uncomfortable in our lives. So a better a suggested um, translation, um, or three suggested translations, which I found quite helpful when I was thinking about this in my experiences, that which is painful, or that which is hard to bear, or that which is stressful, as in placing something under strain. So it's not just you know, suffering in general, but a particular aspect of suffering. The other aspect of dukkha is really there's, there's two kinds of dukkha. Uh, and it's important to differentiate what we're talking about here when we're talking about the cessation of dukkha. Because you've probably heard the expression that, that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. We all experience um, the dukkha of aging, of illness and death, as well as loss and unwelcome changes in our lives. Um, Christina, on, the, on uh, one of the body teachers, referred to these as the unarguables of life. But when the Buddha spoke of the cessation of dukkha, he really meant the cessation of the arguments we have with these unarguables. In other words, how we react to those experiences. Um, you probably heard the story of the second arrow, the first arrow being the, 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 the experience we have, the may possibly the negative or painful experience we have, the second arrow being the, the, the reaction to that, the, uh, the dwelling on it, the, 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 uh, the obsession around it, the stories we tell about it, the anxiety we create in the future. And we are master storytellers. Um, I always like the quote from Mark Twain, who said, um, I've lived through some terrible things in my life, and some of them actually happened. Uh, because we, we tell ourselves all sorts of stories, and many of them are very negative stories. And as I started to pay attention to how these things were playing out in my life, I became aware of several things, really. Firstly, the time and effort that I was putting into different forms of craving and clinging, lots of planning of things, lots of, um, when it came to material things, often researching the purchases or the, or the best way to introduce a particular kind of change into my life. But associated with that was often um, a fair amount of worry about making the wrong choice. Even once choices had been made, I found myself worrying about whether those choices were, had been the right choices. And to some extent, I also started to realize that this type of activity was a displacement activity, what psychologists call a displacement activity. Um, so often, when, particularly when I was stressed, going through a lot of stress at work, I found myself distracting myself from that by craving a new object or researching a new purchase or looking at a new experience, perhaps, that I might uh, purchase or, or go, and, go and explore. 
as a distraction. But I also noticed that satisfying that, if I did satisfy it, didn't make the craving going away, go away. It often sort of moved to something else. Uh, I, sort of, I started to think about it as a sort of a, a spotlight beam of craving that would alight on something. And then once that had that been satisfied, the, the beam moved on to something else. Again, particularly in times of stress, which is related to this whole question of the, the cycle of craving that we can get caught up in. But it is, of course, also a distraction from living life as it is, from, as Stephen says, fully embracing life. Concentrating on this made it very aware to me, uh, very clear to me, uh, how much dukkha in terms of Ankinchino's definitions I, I was really experiencing. Because at times this did create a, a, a tremendous amount of strain, for me anyway. Uh, and, and it did feel at times quite hard to bear, sometimes overwhelming almost. And I think the, the mindfulness of that, the awareness of that, the gradual realization that this was what was going on for me, really became very helpful in the process of thinking about letting go, um, which is the next one I wanted to reflect on, the next task, which is letting go of craving. So the advice of the, the, the body team is that it's really unlikely that you can make the decision to let go of craving. Just, you know, on command, that's it, I'm going to stop. So that was my project out the window for a start. <laughs> um, instead, they recommend that uh, the, the process is really one of becoming increasingly mindful in the way I've just described, in a sense. So, for example... Um, becoming uh, uh, aware of when we are externalizing our search for happiness. Um, and, and just the very process, just as when we become mindful of thought or mindful of feeling, when we become mindful of a process like looking outside ourselves for happiness, that very mindfulness itself can loosen the ties. But we can also be more active in the sense that we can challenge that craving. Firstly, we can reflect on the fact that um, cravings that we've satisfied in the past have been less satisfying than we expected. Um, and there are reasons for that, and I'll come back to that. Um, uh, but we can also challenge it and say, well, you know, will, the satisfying, will satisfying this really make a, a, a material difference to my life? And if so, for how long? Uh, is, it, is this something I need or is it just something I want? How have I fallen into this craving? And there's a wonderful Zen question about this, which is, what is truly lacking in this moment? And I certainly found that when I was practicing meditation around this, looking at these cravings as they were arriving, rising in my, in my mind, um, asking that question on the cushion, what is truly lacking at this moment, often made it clear that nothing was lacking and that the craving was inconsequential, really. And that, again, loosens that ties and allows you to see that the craving can arise, and if you don't pay attention to it, it can fall away as well. Another thing we can do is we can let go of whatever behavior is fueling the craving. Um, um, the body college guys talked about the fire of craving, and that we feed that fire with particular types of fuel and whatever the fuel we use may be different for each of us but you know you can see you know browsing ebay or trade me or um, reading magazines which talk about lifestyle change or daydreaming of owning new things or gaining new experiences or gaining new relationships all of these things feed those cravings and keep them alive so becoming aware of those processes can really be quite helpful. But despite the fact that we have these tools at our disposal, giving up craving, I have to say, is a lot harder than I expected. Uh, and again, there are some pretty clear reasons for this, I think. Um, the fact that the truth of craving is a truth, it's a truth for the same reasons that a cliche is a cliche. It reflects something extremely common, in not, if not universal, in the human experience. I mean, if you think about it, 
um, the teachings and the discussions around craving and dukkha have a very long history going back two and a half thousand years to the Buddhist time. And not only that, but over that two and a half thousand years, the idea of these, these noble tasks or noble truths has resonated across many different cultures, from Tibet to India to USA and the West, um, all of which have very different attitudes, very different values, very different uh, degrees of materialism, if you like. When you see a, uh, something like this in human nature, it does suggest that this is hardwired in, in, into us uh, as a species. Um, and there's a wonderful book on this, which I, I really recommend. I was t telling Ramsey about the other day by a guy called Robert Wright. And the book is called Why Buddhism is True, The Science and Philosophy of Meditation and Enlightenment. Uh, and he uh, writes a lot about um, evolutionary biology and the way in which evolutionary biology has preconditioned us uh, to uh, manifest a lot of the things that Buddhism talks about. For example, he says that um, um, uh, evolutionary bio biology has uh, created in us, uh, genetically uh, programmed into us, if you like, over millions of years, abilities and drives that increase our, the likelihood that our genes are going to be passed on to the next generation. This is obvious. Um, but when you think about this in terms of craving, um, uh, going back, thinking about when we were when we were living in caves or whatever, the ability to attract the desire to attract uh, or, or gain possession of objects and things that might signify our attractiveness and our status in society will increase our attractiveness to the opposite sex and increase our likelihood of passing on our genes to the next generation. Similarly, the desire or the constant um, feeling that we need to improve or change our environment to increase our comfort or increase our security, again, increases our chances of passing on our genes. So over, over, over eons and over multiple generations, this can become hardwired as, as a pattern within us. And associated with that is, is um, if you were going to design a kind of system that was going to do this, it would be helpful to have associated with that um, certain delusions. For example, overestimating the benefits of having an object of desire, overestimating the amount of pleasure that we will get once we've we gained that object of desire. And similarly, underestimating how short-lived the sense of pleasure will be that we get from that, object, that, that having that object. These things all have benefits for us simply in terms of passing our genes on. Of course, it does have benefits for us as a society, as a species, if you like, because the desire to fix things has created technology, it's allowed us to dominate nature, and indeed actually eradicate many of the sources of the unarguable sort of, um, suffering that, that mankind experiences or has experienced. But the hardwiring comes at a cost. That same continual desire for change that works so well for us as a species can be a source of unhappiness at the individual level. Because the thing about evolution is that it cares a lot about your genes, but it doesn't really care about you. And of course, at a societal level, these sorts of things are, are also reinforced by the social norms and the values, particularly of, of Western society. Because materialism is the foundation for our economy. Um, business, economic and business growth is the, possibly the single most important measure that politicians pay attention to. And that, that growth, as we know, and there's a lot of discussion about, an increasing amount of discussion about this around these days, of course, that growth requires continuous consumption. So what we have is advertising promoting continuous wanting. Uh, and the best example I've seen of this was a, a sign I saw in a, a sort of fashion boutique here in Brisbane. I meant to take a picture of it, but I never, I never got around to it. But the sign said, it was a woman's clothes shop, it said, my only constant is the need for a new look. And I thought, boy, if that's not a recipe for unhappiness, I just don't know what is. Um, so this sort of thing is becoming embedded in popular culture and in the notions of conspicuous consumption, which I have to say is much more prevalent here in Australia than it is in New Zealand. And in a way, we're sort of starting to, if we haven't already, 
replace that Cartesian notion of I think, therefore I am, with um, I own, therefore I am. We identify with our possessions, with the things that we surround ourselves with. So all of this can result in some really quite deep-seated habits that um, uh, could be lifelong, but they can start very early in life. I've got two young kids. I hope you can't hear them in the background. I can. Um, but uh, the, they, are, they are beset by advertising. They are beset by these messages that you need to identify yourselves with owning certain things. Um, so it's not really surprising with all of these forces that this is really incredibly resistant to change. These patterns are resistant to change. Which I suppose brings me on to the, the, the last of the noble truths I really wanted to think about, which was um, reflections on putting this into practice and realizing cessation. So have I realized, realized cessation? No, not really, I confess. But I have noticed certain things, certain changes, some of which I think are quite fundamental. The first thing I noticed was a falling away of the desire to desire, the wanting to want. I certainly noticed initially that um, if, for example, we found something in the house that had failed or we needed to buy, a new, buy something new, there was an element in my mind, unconscious almost, that was uh, gleeful <laughs> when it discovered that there was this gap. Uh, finding a new object to desire, there was a, a certain excitation associated with that. And I'm not sure that this wanting to want is just something that besets me, because if you think about it, well, what is browsing or window shopping if it's not looking for something to want? Um, what is spending time in the mall or hanging out in the shops if you're not wanting, looking for something to want? And of course, nowadays, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is made much easier by, by the internet. We don't even need, need to leave the comfort of our own homes to find many, many objects that we might want. But I've noticed a falling away in that. And I've also noticed a suspicion um, of that craving when it occurs, a kind of feeling of, oh God, here we go again, a sort of sinking feeling, because I actually don't want to want, because I've become aware of how much strain it can create, how much dukkha it can create. And that, that was the first, no, first thing I noticed as a result of this mindfulness process. Another thing I noticed, and it was more subtle, was um, a resistance to the letting go of craving. I'm not sure whether that was related to um, giving up or the idea of giving up all this displacement activity and, oh my goodness, what might I find when I let go of this displacement activity? Or a, a, a sense that the craving was. In a, and the, 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 the activity of obtaining is some kind of lifeline. I think there was, a, there was a, um, the, uh, an awareness that the choice to let go of this crazy anxiety and a kind of a little voice at the back of my mind saying, well, where do I go to for succor and comfort if I can't go out there and, 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 and grab something, own something, possess something, experience something? Um, I've just got to sit here with whatever it is. Um, and I think I noticed, it was rather subtle, but I think I noticed almost a sense of mourning at the idea of giving that up. Um, um, so being mindful of that was actually quite interesting. However, I have found myself taking more pra some practical steps as well. I found myself drawn to the idea of simplifying and prioritizing and letting go of material attachments. So been a lot of, um, particularly in the last few months, selling things off, um, giving things away, um, which is a form of renunciation, um, something that Akinchino recommended, because when you break the ties that you have with material things, it helps break the habit of A, uh, identifying with those things, and B, perhaps acquiring those things in the first place. And linked to that was the, a sense of really trying to declutter my life, simplify my life. Um, and one of the inspirations for this was a book by somebody called Brooke McCallery called Live Life Simply. And it was about her experience of really trying to declutter and simplify her life, living life more mindfully, living with less, um, and and not trying to do all this at once, 
but breaking it down into bite-sized pieces. Because if you're like me and you're family with kids, you know, you've got a house full of stuff, just trying to get rid of it all at once. And so far as you can get rid of some of it, a lot of it you've got to keep. Um, but in so far as you can get rid of things, trying to do it all at once is just too much. So breaking it down and doing that piece by piece and just looking at it as a slow process um, is something that she recommended I find quite helpful. I'm also finding myself being more mindful when I am acquiring new things, more critical of the desire associated with that and the process. Um, asking those questions about is this just a craving that's emerged out of nowhere or is it a genuine need that we have? Um, and it's quite difficult, again, when you've got small kids because there's a constant churn of toys and books and clothes as as they reach different stages in their life and they outgrow what they've currently, what they had in the past and they need new stuff. So it's very easy to have a life that becomes full of clutter and a garage that slowly fills up with stuff uh, unless you keep on top of it. So I guess part of the decluttering has a practical side for me as well. More fundamentally, I guess, than that, uh, in a way, has been a change in the attitude to my um, approach to work. Um, I found myself going through this process of also analyzing what it was I was craving or looking for from a work environment and a work process and what satisfaction I was getting from work. Um, and I've, I've actually, as a result of that, um, stepped back from the career ladder, if you think, uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, I mean, perhaps to some extent that's a time of life thing, but I've made this decision to take a position that's lower in the hierarchy than where I was before, a bit less pay, but a lot more time and a lot more flexibility and uh, a shift in my work-life life balance that allows me to spend more time with my young kids in that small window that we have with them when they're young and also perhaps bring a bit more balance into the family between my, my wife and myself. My wife also has a very busy job. Um, so. I find that this has, been, this has been quite a healthy letting go in its own right. And I think the last thing I want to say about this was that um, meditation was quite an important part of this mindfulness, this increasing mindfulness of, of the process and the experience. But it wasn't enough for me on its own, at least for me. I found that the intellectual understanding of these concepts of these teachings and what they really meant um, and the philosophy that underlay them was also very important, as was putting that into practice in an everyday, in everyday life, not just sitting on the cushion, but going out there and trying to live it, which really reflects Stephen's recommendation that you know, we need to take this out into action. Um, so, so I'm just aware of, of time, but really it's just to sort of sum up and in conclusion, I guess, I would say that the more I studied and thought about these noble tasks or noble truths, the more they made sense to me in the context of my own experience, the more they helped explain certain things that I was experiencing in my life. Putting them into practice is not easy, I don't think. You're fighting the norms of society, you're also fighting millions of years of evolution. Um, it's like many things in life, it's, it's, it's a messy, um, iterative, and probably quite a long process. And at the moment, I guess I'm not sure whether I should be thinking of this as in terms of an outcome that I want to achieve or just simply a journey of discovery and, and, and continual learning and letting go. Um, um, you know, there is a, a Zen saying, just, just let go, let go, let go. I suspect this is going to be a continual process of, of continuing to let go. Um, but I do believe that that cessation is possible. And my experience is that even small victories along the path can bring some great rewards. Um, and I guess um, there... I've experienced some fundamental changes in attitude and what I regard as important through this study and this practice. And it came to, just as a final note, it came to, um, it came to my mind when we were, I was sitting with some friends in a cafe and we were talking about 
BHAGs, I don't know if you've come across this, BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals, I guess, again, we were all at a certain time of life. But people were talking about things like, you know, going on competitive runs across the Simpson Desert in Australia or uh, embarking on and completing a PhD or learning a new language or traveling the world or whatever. And I sat there and I reflected on this. I thought, well, actually, if I was going to have a BHAG now, if I was going to um, embark on a BHAG, and perhaps I have, it's really, again, trying to pursue this cessation of dukkha in my life. Um, and hopefully that indicates that all of this thing that I've been doing, this project that I embarked on, has really taken root within me. And who knows, in five years' time, I can come back and sit in front of you and say, I've achieved it. So that's all I really wanted to say about that. So I, I might just open it up to questioning. Thank you, Jonathan. If anybody wants to ask Jonathan a question, I suggest you go up to the computer and uh, face it. Oh, what do you want to see? First question. Observation. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, my name is Alex. Um, There's I really no need to kneel in front of me, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite got that far down the path. <laughs> the, um, I, I'm really interested in, um, I guess, trying to your observations about, I guess, like our culture and our society and how that develops or builds a lot of craving in us is, is for me like one of the hardest parts about dealing with craving, the constant advertising and, and things like that in terms of ambition. And I guess one thing which I'm wondering or was thinking about in your talk was how to try to sort of balance those aspects between the fact that we live in a society which is very much orientated around acquisition and wanting things with also the four, the four great tasks. Um, so one thing which I was thinking about was like, for example, I, I'm being offered like a new job or, or a job which pays more money. And I'm sort of like, well, I do. The, the only reason I'm interested in the new job is because it offers more money. And that's the, the sole reason. And all the other things about lifestyle balance and everything like that is sort of cast to the side. But I'm aware, though, that I'm then put in a situation of craving. I guess what I'm coming to is um, how do you deal, I guess, like if I'd never had craving for another job, then I would still be working at McDonald's where I started. Um, I guess, how do you sort of like, how do you, do you, do you have any advice on how you sort of balance it within our society, the, the desire for avoiding craving with the fact that we've got to live and be in a culture that's very craving orientated? Yeah, and, and also, you, know, you do need, a, well, firstly, you need a, level, a certain level of, 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 of material comfort <laughs> in order to have a sense of well being. And you need certain possessions in order to be able to engage with life in certain ways. You know, um, people talk about boys with toys and so on. But if you don't have a surfboard, you can't surf. Um, if you don't have a four-wheel drive, you can't go exploring the outback of Australia. Whatever. You know, there are certain things that are enabling of of um, uh, lifestyle improvements. Um, I mean, so one of the things I, I tend to do now is, like, like I said earlier on. I do think when I'm thinking about buying something, you know, if you're talking about something material, I do think, well, what difference is it really going to make? Um, you know, so, so I've got a 10 year old four wheel drive sitting in the garage, uh, cost me money because it's 10 years old. If I got, if I spent another $20,000, could I get a better one? Yeah, I probably could. But then I have $20,000 sitting in the garage. Most of the time I cycle to work. It comes out at weekends every now and again. We go on holiday with the family. It's a waste of money. Why well, would, it, I, would I feel better going there, driving down the road in it? Mm, not really. It's a bit pretentious. You know? it's, not, it's not necessary. So you can challenge some of the things you're looking for. The other thing is um, there's, a, there's a very interesting book written by an economist on the subject of happiness. And he's shown that um, um, uh, if you're really earning very little, like you're working in McDonald's or somewhere, um, Getting an increase in your salary is going to increase your sense of well-being. It is going to increase your, your, your net happiness. You come to reach a point, however, where increasing in salary don't make any difference at all. You might, you might be happy initially, but then you'll, you'll, you'll slip, often fall back to you know, a kind of a, a standard level. And beyond that, you're really not achieving a great deal. 
And I think so if you, you really need to say, well, where it also depends on where you are in your life. I mean, if you've got kids who are at school and then there's a certain level of income and so on. Um, but uh, uh, you really need to think about, well, well what's the trade-off here? Any, 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 any job with bigger responsibilities, um, uh, greater accountability, more hours, uh, uh, is going to have a significant trade-off with, with the money that you get for that. Um, so I guess at all times, it's always worth being mindful of why am I wanting this? Is it really just I want more status or power? Is it because I think I should be progressing up the career ladder? Or is it making a practical difference um, in my life? Is it, making, is it really allowing me to develop professionally, allowing me to do things that I wasn't able to do in the past? So I think these are the sort of things that we can, we can these are the questions we can ask ourselves to determine whether it's worthwhile going down that path. Um, I mean, there are complications around that and it all depends on our own individual circumstance because what's good for you now may, may be different from what's good for you in 10 years time. And you also need to be positioning yourself for 10 years time as well. So, um, you know, I don't know whether that's answered your question, but I think these are some of the sort of things that we need to bear in mind. I think that's really good, Jonathan. It's uh, questions that I can ask myself. So, yeah, that's really yeah. good. I, I certainly think that, that, that we can ignore the advertising. There's a lot of bollocks out there. Um, one of the things we did when we lived in New Zealand was we stopped watching TV, um, which was quite difficult for the first year. Um, but we still don't watch TV. So we have, we have no TV advert projected into our house. We have a TV and we watch movies online, but we don't watch any, anything with any advertising. Um, so my kids aren't exposed to that stuff, um, and they don't have phones. Uh, because, you know, the oldest is twelve. Why? Why do they need a phone? Why do they need a smartphone? They've got friends of theirs who've got phones, and they're starting to think, "Oh, so and so's got a phone, and I haven't." But we just say, "No, no, it's not. It's not helpful. It's not productive. It's probably unhealthy." Um, so I think there are things that you can do to manage the uh, the influence of these things on your life as well. Thank you. Next, who, who, who was a question? Just got a brief comment. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. It was uh, great. I, I, I won't kneel as well. <laughs> My, awesome. My name's Jeremy. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, point out that um, the part where you were talking about observing your own craving and just that little... Um, comment that you actually start to become excited when you notice that you were craving, which was very helpful for me because um, actually appreciating when you're supposedly doing something that's unhelpful for you, because it's quite easy to just criticize yourself every time you notice that you're going down that pathway. and getting excited about it is sort of like a little remedy for that and, um, you know, uh, brightens up the whole process of introspection, which can be very neurotic. <laughs> can be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, but if, if you're being, sorry, that was, are you finished? Sorry, I'm interrupting. I just wanted to say thank you for that because it was a oh. nice little moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 but I, in a way, that's the essence of mindfulness, isn't it? It's, it's, um, it's noticing some, something without judgment. Um, and just, I, I think, I always think that, um, I like to describe the, the mind as a thought generating machine. You know, that, that our, the muscles in our hands have evolved to move our fingers in a particular way. Everything in our body has evolved with a certain purpose. One of the purposes of our mind, one of the key purposes of our mind is to continually generate thoughts. Um, and one of the sets of thoughts that it generates is the craving thoughts. And you can stand back from that and go, oh, there's a craving thought, you know? And if you don't, if you don't engage with it, like any other thought, if you don't engage with it, you can, you can witness it arising and passing away. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was, I think it was quite exciting for me to realize not just, uh, I was noticing craving thoughts, but I was noticing wanting to want something in me that wanted to want because that's the displacement activity. That's something in me that uh, found that whole process really 
quite exciting and quite engaging, despite the fact that it, there was an obsessional quality about it, I feel it was quite unhealthy. Jonathan, it's Duncan here. Hi, Duncan. Can I, can I just ask, <clears throat> so when for you the, the thinking arises, <clears throat> um, you can sort of take a CBT approach to it, to sort of challenging it. Yeah. To an extent, sort of re reasoning your way through it. Um, or you can attempt more of an act Mm -hmm. uh, perspective on it, which is allowing it to take its fullest expression, um, and trusting in time that it will dissolve. Um, and I'm sort of I'm sort of interested in like quite a lot of the language that you've used has been sort of from the CBT perspective of challenging it. Where do, where do you sort of on that, where, where do you, where do you sit between those? Um, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I did train as a as a clinical psychologist in in CBT, but um, that was that was many years ago. Uh, if I if you would push me to opt for one or the other, I would say um, the mindfulness approach, the ACT approach, would would, would be more productive. Um, but I also find that um, personally. A mixture of challenge and just simply allowing can be quite helpful. Uh, in loosening, it's all really about loosening your association with whatever the thought is, loosening the impact that it can have on you, um, and and undermining the credibility of, of of the thought in the first place can be part of that, um, as well as just standing back from it and allowing it to arise and pass away. I suppose it depends, I guess if it was, uh, I find the challenge thing quite useful if, if it's repetitive. I suppose that's when I would use the challenge more. Because I find it coming back and back, I'll really start saying, really, <laughs> is, is this really relevant? Come on. <laughs> and also ha almost having that dialogue with my mind. Um, well, could, could because this is this is a paradox I struggle with all the time. Because in challenging it, that's an expression of a craving to be rid of the experience. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, and, and and look, that you've got to one of the uh, essential paradoxes at the heart of meditation practice, in a way, because you know we're asked to uh, we, the decision to meditate, the decision to embark on the path of the Dharma, the decision to set time aside in your day to this particular activity as opposed to other activities uh, is an active decision. Um, and it it's, you, are, you are trying, by doing so, you are trying to affect some kind of change. And yet at the same time, the process should be about accepting things as they are. And that's one of the paradoxes inherent in the whole process. Um, but I, I, no, I, I, that, we just have to live with that. that. That is one of the paradoxes in this practice. There are paradoxes in many other practices as well. Um, but nevertheless, the, par the practice can be helpful. Mm. Um, actually, I attended a retreat just last December. Um, it talk there's, there's a particular sutta or something where the Buddha talks about dealing with troubling thoughts. And like the first thing he advocates is, I think, what would... would act would fall under or just uh, just pay attention to it and often that's enough and the mind will just turn away of its own accord mm. um but then it goes on to like four other techniques and the last one's like grab onto it with your mind and firmly <laughs> concentrate on something else and, like, that's only to be used in extreme circumstances but like um some of them in the middle of it, it talks about he uses the metaphor of uh using a smaller thorn to push out a bigger thorn. So using these challenging thoughts to kind of dislodge whatever it is that's stuck. stuck yeah, there. yeah. Um, and all that just to say, it seemed, it seemed like the Buddha advocated for both. Yeah. yeah. I know that discourse, and you're right, the fourth one was really quite aggressive, really. It was sort of getting angry with yourself. But there's a, you know, there's a more gentle approach as well. Have, have you come across the work, um, the work of Mathieu Ricard? 
some he has got his own website, but he's very, he's he's the guy who's known as the happiest man in the world because of all this study that's been done on his his mind. He's the um, he's the uh, Dalai Lama's translator, but he started work with the as a um, Ramsey will correct me. He was a biologist, I think, or a neurologist with the Pasteur Institute. He has a PhD from the Pasteur Institute, and he spent his he spent his life as a Buddhist monk, really. Um, and he's got some wonderful stuff. He's written a great book on happiness, the secrets of happiness. And he talks about compassion practice as, in, in a way, um, what do you call it, an antidote to all these things. So um, this is a more gentle version of what you're talking about there. That if you if you're um, uh, that well, if you're experiencing negative mind states that you find hard to deal with, if you um, practice meta meditation that becomes an antidote to those met those negative mental states so he's taking an active decision not to challenge them but to replace them with something else that's more productive and if, and if i can just come in here this is ramsey um i would just say that this is why i think you mentioned this also jonathan that, that practicing the first three tasks is just not enough you know, to experience life, let go of greed, hatred, delusion, confusion, and stop and savor the moment. It's, just enough. it's that fourth task of, uh, which gets you into the, the ideas behind it and it gets you to be less self, more, more selfless and less self-centered. And if, again, it's, iterative is the word you use. Um, I think Stephen calls it a positive feedback loop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because in a way you need... Um, you, you could become you could become a mindful sadist. <laughs> you, you could you could use mindfulness to get rid of your guilt at causing suffering in others. Um, so in a sense, I always think that mindfulness is all very well, but what do you do with it? You know, mindfulness is in a way is a tool, um, and the the, the, the the eightfold path is really giving us that ethical foundation to say, well, if if once you've achieved this mindfulness, here is what you do. You know, you do have, um, you do have, um, um, you, you choose a, a livelihood which is worthwhile, which is beneficial, which is compassionate, etc., etc. And, and I think that's an important complement to the, the more technical aspect of, of, of mindfulness practice. Jonathan, can we take one final observation or question from someone? And then I think time's up for the evening. So, one last. No, I think that's it. Uh, well, w from us here in Wellington, thank you very much, John. It's been a very interesting evening. We've enjoyed it. We're going to have a cup of tea now, and we're going to talk about what you've been telling us. That would be very good. Excellent. We have one day uh, in person, perhaps. Yes, yes. Well, I hope so. We're, we're, well, we're visiting uh, New Zealand uh, at the beginning of next year, but unfortunately, I think we're just going to be up in Auckland, unfortunately. But I'm no doubt I'll be back in Wellington at some stage, and it would be lovely, lovely to come along and meet you all in person. Yeah, we'd like that too. Where so, are you, by the way? Where is this space? This is the Quaker Centre in oh, Melbourne. Oh, the Quaker Centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We come here for the Insight Group, if I remember rightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it. Okay. Well, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And, uh, all the best with your practice. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ramsey. Bye bye, Jonathan.